Good evening, everybody. My name is Professor Janis Pitsilardis, and I'm Professor of Sport and Exercise Science at the University of Brighton. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizing committee of this event for inviting me to give this short talk. My primary message, which is an important message during this pandemic, will be that we need to carefully consider our evolutionary history when determining future health choices. My message is well encapsulated in this commentary we published in the journal The Lancet in 2017, where we highlight the mismatch between our body and the world we are creating. I plan to develop this theme in the next slides. But before I do that, I'd like to stress the fact that the biggest threat to humanity is not COVID-19, but the starvation of physical activity. In this paper, published in Nature back in 2004 by my good friend Dan Lieberman, they remind us that we are born to run. Specifically, they refer to numerous features of the human skeleton that suggest strongly that running is derived capability of the genus Homo that originated some two million years ago and was instrumental in our evolution. This becomes clearly apparent when we compare numerous anatomical features between the chimpanzee and us humans. In particular, features such as the ones listed here, for example, the nickel ligament, the short snout, low wide shoulders, expanded lumbar centro surface area, long legs, long Achilles tendons, and so on. All these features depicted on the corresponding illustration on the right hand side demonstrate that humans are born to run born to move. These are many of the features that can also influence running economy within humans. More evidence that running did play an important role in our evolution. Equally compelling evidence that we are designed to run is our ability to sweat that greatly differentiates us from our primate cousins and our hunted prey that we could not outrun, but we could outsmart. Watch this short video that could have happened any time in the past 100,000 years. No longer does he follow the tracks. He runs where they will run. He twists back where they will twist back. He runs among the thorns to chase them out of the shade. He drives them into the open. He does not slow down. He thinks of his family who must eat meat. After three hours, he is close, but cannot see them. The day reaches the hottest. This is good. The Kudu's blood will soon boil. Karoha must outrun his thirst. He is testing himself. Can I do this? Run with no bow or poison. Keep chasing with no rest. Only myself and my spears. For four hours he runs without stopping. The one God has set aside is dead on her feet. Now Karoha is controlling her. A key milestone in our evolution happened very recently, about 10,000 years ago, when we commenced agriculture and farming. This enabled easier access to food than having to hunt over many hours of running in the heat of the African savanna. But 10,000 years is only a very brief period in our evolution, some 500 generations only, so not much time for evolutionary change to occur. Since we ceased being hunter-gatherers, humans have changed their diet and physical environments so radically and so rapidly that natural selection has had little time to react. As a result, the Paleolithic bodies we inherited are mismatched with the modern environmental conditions. For instance, 
Here's a picture I took of the Nandi district in Kenya. The Nandi district is in the Rift Valley province. The Nandi region is an area known for producing a disproportionately high number of Olympic running legends. Compare this photo of the Nandi district to this photo of any large city. This happens to be a, a photograph of the city of Tokyo in Japan, which is the host city of our next Olympic Games. Half of the world's population now live in urban areas, and it is predicted that by the year 2050, about 90% of the developed world will be urbanized. And here's a powerful cartoon depiction of this mismatch, mismatch between our bodies and the world we have created, courtesy of my friend Dan Lieberman. Let's see what impact this mismatch can be having on sporting performance. These are the results from the Rio Olympics, athletic events from the 1500 meters to the marathon for males and females, gold, silver, and bronze. If we populate only the Kenyan athletes, we see 12 medalists from Kenya. Ignore the other flags. If we add Ethiopian athletes, we have 20 of the 30 medalists from these two countries, Kenya and Ethiopia. Then two medals from Mo Farah, who was born in Somalia, East African region also, the athletes of African ancestry from Algeria and France. That leaves us only three white male athletes from the USA, one from New Zealand, and two female athletes from the USA. In 2006, together with friends, we published this book on East African running to coincide with the launch of a new research center. Listed here, are the five possible explanations for the dominance of East Africans we proposed. Superior genetics, solid foundation built over many years of running to school, socioeconomic and cultural factors, high altitude training, and the African diet. Since then, we have eliminated superior genetics. For today's talk, I'll focus only on running to school. Let me share with you some interesting information about a very special school in Kenya but this could be typical of any school in the region. Location of the school is near the Nandi Rock, about 1,716 meters above sea level. The school is called Pemja Primary School. You can read the motto of the school here, which states, life is a struggle. And you can see that struggle from the photos that show how tough it is getting to and from the school. The need, for example, to fetch water, much of the struggle will also be illustrated in a short film, a film about the way of life of these kids from a documentary movie called Enhance, directed by award-winning director, Alex Gibney. Here's a small extract from that film. The environment there is so conducive to East African running success. They will be living a very natural life. They won't be on their computer games. They won't be all on their telephones. And the most profound thing I've learned from doing this research is the fact that they will run to school. So I grew up in a remote area in Nandi County called Kavsiyo. We used to run half and town. We used to run to school and back. And that's how life is in Kenya. Getting to the school, this five kilometer trek that they have to do, they do that always without any shoes and you're jumping from one rock to the other. It's raining, it's muddy, it's stony, it's uh, grass, it's got all the different conditions you'd imagine. And they do that at least four times a day. They come to school, they sometimes will run back home to have lunch, they'll come back to the school and then they'll, they'll be dismissed. Living the, you know, in the countryside, it's really hard work, hard, it's tough, you know. You don't get uh, maybe enough uh, clean water sometimes, you don't get enough electricity, you know, even it's, electric, it's difficult to distribute in the countryside. It was, you know, challenging. Life's not so easy. Life is a struggle. So they endure so much hardship so when it comes to running, when other athletes from around the world are experiencing pain and finding this really tough, for them it's just normal, you know, so they can endure what others can't do. How are you? You may have noticed the strap on the feet of the children towards the end of that film. 
It was our foot sensor that was being used to analyze the children's running mechanics. Devices similar to an accelerometer, like many of us have used to quantify physical activity. Here you see my son many years ago wearing such a device. The activity of interest is combining the orange and the red in what we call moderate to vigorous physical activity. And using here, the depiction we've used here is what are called the Evenson cutoffs. And so using these cutoffs, we publish for the first time the very high physical activity levels of these children. Notice the data here, very high MVPA for girls, 140 minutes per day, ranging from 109 to 193 minutes. And for boys, the very high 173 minutes, ranging from 131 to 234 minutes per day. I don't have time to go through this paper published in Nature in great detail, where we reveal the foot strike patterns and collision forces in habitual barefoot and, and shod runners. As you can see, they look very different with an impact force on the left showing the shod runners, while no impact force on the barefoot runners on the right hand side. And we have published many papers since on the implications of this barefoot running style. And we typically think of this being normal, running wearing shoes, but actually this is normal, running barefoot. And I wish to remind you of the first African gold medalist who was a baby bikile who won gold in the marathon in Rome wearing no shoes. So in 2017, we published this unique data from two closely related studies that investigate the foot structure, function, injury prevalence, and physical activity levels of habitual shod and habitual barefoot youngsters. Both, both cohorts were matched for age, sex, and body mass. And we collected a, a number of variables, which I'll go through during my presentation. Here we see the subject characteristics that simply confirm that the two cohorts were very well matched for age and for weight. And here you see that the habitual barefoot subjects spent more time engaged in moderate and vigorous physical activity, the orange and the red that I showed you previously, and this is probably what you would expect. Interestingly, heel bone stiffness, which is an indicator of bone density, was much higher in the habitual barefoot than in the habitual shod in both left and right heels. And here are some of the measures we made in both cohorts. The Achilles moment arm was determined, as you can see on the right from photographs, where we could measure the distance from the medial and lateral horizontal distance from the most prominent tip of the tibia and fibula malleoli to the posterior aspect of the Achilles tendon. And in the second cohort, a short Achilles moment arm length was found in habitual barefoot. And I don't have time to go through that data, but previous studies have interestingly found that a short Achilles tendon moment arm increases the amount of elastic energy stored in the Achilles tendon during running. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see the device we used to measure foot muscle strength. So what did we find? As you can see here, highlighted in red, digits one to four flexion and short foot exercise strength were higher in the habitual barefoot than in the habitual shod. So clearly we can see both structural and functional differences between the two cohorts. But the most interesting finding or the most impressive finding is looking at the injury prevalence. And this was in response to a question about injuries over the past year. And this clinical assessment was done by a specialist orthopedic surgeon. surgeon. And note the remarkable results here. 8% injury prevalence in the habitual barefoot, but the remarkable 61% in habitual shod. And these data, as I'm sure you agree, are pretty impressive. So what did we conclude? We conclude that the significant differences observed in foot parameters, injury prevalence, and general foot health between the habitual, uh, uh, the habitual um, barefoot and habitual shod suggest that footwear conditions may impact or do impact on the foot structure and function and on general foot health. So in other words, what I've tried to demonstrate in this short presentation is how our bodies are mismatched with the world we have created. And this also includes the use and abuse of shoes. 
So to conclude, as also reflected in this Lancet commentary published in 2017, to correct this mismatch between the, 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 our bodies and the world we've created, we need to understand our past and find ways to match our body's design to the world we are creating in view of establishing a successful future, a future where physical activity is, like our ancestral past, a main component of our daily lives. I would like to thank the organizers for this invitation, and I hope you found my presentation interesting and useful. Thank you very much.